decide, really decide, that means kind of the death of other options. Okay, most people go through life never committing to anything. They change it, they change goals, jobs, everything like they change underwear every day, okay? And you've got to make, life is about decisions. Welcome back to the Max Out Show, where today I'm honored to speak with John Addison, CEO of Addison Leadership Group. For 16 years, he was co-CEO of Primerica, a financial service businesses with over 100,000 representatives before embarking on his own entrepreneurial journey and teaching thousands of people around the world how to become the leaders and humans that they want to be. So John, welcome to the show. Great to be here today, my friend. Great to be here. I'm so excited to have you. And I have to tell you, diving into you and your story was just absolutely incredible because there's so many great nuggets of wisdom waiting for our, our listeners today. And so to get started, I want to really introduce this concept of real leadership. You know, did you both your book about it? It's right behind you. And so can you share with our listeners what you mean by a real leader? You know, I want to... When I'm talking about real, which it kind of came to us as we were talking about doing the book as I was finishing my career as CEO of a public company, I mean authentic. I believe that, you know, most of us in life, you know, I, I believe it is great to try to imitate other people that are great leaders. It is wonderful to try to, um, you know, learn from all of the people that why people, I believe you have to take the best, leave the rest, and turn what you learn into you. Because the, in the history of the world, back to as far as we can go into ancient times, there's only one you. And when you're dead, there won't be another you. And you have to be true to yourself, authentic to yourself, take things you learn and develop it into your style and then be real. Okay. Be who you are and be the best you, you can be. You'll never, if you're trying to imitate someone else, you're going to always be a pale copy of that person. You've got to be true to yourself, work on yourself, and be the best you you can be. So I think in a kind of simple explanation, that's what I mean by real, just being authentic, being true to yourself, being a trustworthy person, somebody that tells people the truth, somebody that, um, like I said, is just, you know, uh, back when growing up, when I did, I'm um, in my 60s now, but, you know, was a teenager in the 70s, everybody used to say, get real, okay, <laughs> which meant, you know, be, be truthful. And um, I think that's what I mean by it, Max. You know, John, I love this so much, and I really want to dive deeper later on into this, this aspect of deciding who we want to be in our life, right, and who we want to become. But for now, you, you mentioned this aspect of learning from the greatest leaders. And I know that you've been an avid student throughout your whole life of people like Winston Churchill, like Benjamin Franklin. What were some of those lessons that you've learned early on, you know, in your college, basically, that, that then later on helped you really succeed in business? Well, I, I, you know, I'm a, uh, Max, I'm a firm believer. You know, I believe in personal development. But people, you know, have always asked me, you know, what books do you read? And, you know, if you could see my giant library beside me over here, which this, uh, uh, the, uh, the screen aims uh, back toward a fireplace behind me in my study. Wow. But uh, I have, I, I read history, okay? I read biographies of people I admire, the Abraham Lincolns, the Sir Winston Churchill, the people, you know, because you know, I look at things, a lot of times people write books that just write books, okay? I always wanted to learn from somebody who had walked through the fire, had been through the tests and trials of leadership. 
And, you know, I'm right now uh, just finishing an incredibly thick volume uh, on Sir Winston Churchill that's about a year and a half old, uh, written by Andrew Roberts, uh, uh, a British historian. It's a very good book and really kind of does a good job of showing the complexities of his personality. And, you know, the truth is, um, you know, like all of us, you know, he had his, uh, you know, I, I call it snakes in the attic. I mean, you know, we all have our things we wrestle with in our brains. And, you know, he had a very complicated relationship with his parents. Um, when I was in London for uh, a company that I, I'm, I'm affiliated with doing some work, Utility Warehouse, in the United Kingdom, and um, I one day I had a day where I could just you know jaunt out. I took the train to Cambridge, and was um, I'm friends. I'm a member of the International Churchill Society, and I went to the Churchill Library at Cambridge. And um, and one of the things I wanted to see is there's a letter. You know they have all of his documents, but there's a letter there written to him by his father when he was like 10 years, old, 10 years old at boarding school. And his father had given him a watch that was his grandfather's and Winston, young Winston had lost it. And his father wrote him a letter, which I mean, is the most awful thing you've ever read. It's like, you're a total disappointment. You'll never amount to anything. I can't trust you with anything. Your brother, Jack, exceeds you at everything in life. Yet, in his life, Winston, when he wrote about things, wrote about this glowing relationship. I mean, he wrote <laughs> a two-volume biography of his father. And, and so he had a lot of complexities and failed miserably in the 1930s. He was basically out of power for a decade and then came back and, and on, in all honesty, saved Western civilization from Nazism. And so my view is to read about, read really great biographies of people that you admire what they did. And then you'll also understand all of their failures, all of their foibles. All, uh, nobody's perfect. Every, we are all imperfect messes. I mean, that's how we are. And the truth is, you know, it, it, that we have to find the strength within us and the compassion within us and the power within us to do great things. And uh, so anyway, that's what I learn as much from all of their challenges, all of their human failures, all of their frailties, as I do from their strengths. Um, you know, I think that's one of our challenges now as we, you know, in this kind of complex world we're in and we're looking back at historical figures and stuff. Well, guess what? There is nobody you're gonna look back at in the history of the world that was a perfect person <laughs> that yes. didn't do say, or do things that weren't wrong or bad even, or say things that you go, oh my God, I can't believe he or she said that. Guess what? They're, they're human beings, which means they're, 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 they're complex people like you and I. You know, I always none of us want a camera on us 24 hours a day. Okay, but the truth is the people I admire are the people who overcome all of those inadequacies and go out and do great things. Yes, you know, I love that so much, especially this fact that, yes, like you say, you can't do anything great in your life without failing, without running into stumbling blocks, right? Without even sometimes sacrificing our own values, our own, you know, ideals and morals in the pursuit of something better. And so I love what you're saying here about really studying those, those great people that we all admire and seeing they're also just human beings, just like you and I are. You know, Max, Sir Winston Churchill, the quote is hanging right over here above my door, but says success is the ability to go from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. If you're a leader and you're trying to make things happen, you got to realize that if you're leading a large organization, when I was leading Primerica, 
through all those years, through all the different era, we took the company public in 2010, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about kind of the challenges and stuff of that later. But one of the things I learned is you, we were, it was a very diverse organization, hundred thousand people in the, in the, in the sales force, uh, you know, over 2000 people in our corporate headquarters, all from all walks of life, all very different, very different political views, religious views, every kind of view. And when you're a leader, you're, you're never going to make everybody act like you think like you be like you. Okay. You've got to understand that life is a compromise. That's one of the things I feel like we particularly lost in, you know, I don't know how things are in Switzerland, but I know here in the United States, it's, you know, no one, I mean, compromise is a bad word. Yeah. And, you know, all people do is dig in on either side, hate one another. And so my view is when you are the person responsible for moving an organization or a group forward, that means you've got to figure out how to compromise. Now, that doesn't mean compromising your values, okay? But let me tell you what, the number of times I heard people say, well, John, I can't, I can't do this because it's a matter of principle. Usually, matter of principle in my career meant matter of money. Okay, <laughs> that you know, that, you know, pe a lot of people lump so many things into their principles. Okay, well, the truth is, your principles ought to be to be good to people, not lie, not steal, not cheat. You know, not harm things. But the truth is, most things I ever dealt with, it was a matter of opinion on either side. And if one side gave a little bit and didn't get as much as they wanted, but got a lot of what they wanted, and the other side did the same thing, then you could move things forward. And I fear we've lost that so much now that, you know, people just don't want, you know, I always said you can disagree without being disagreeable. Okay. And, you know, everything, I, and, and I'll be honest, you know, I know I'm, I'm going to sound like an old, old person now, but I honestly think social media has made all of that so much worse. Oh, yes. Because so, it is so easy to be with a, you know, with a, with a moniker on a keyboard, you know, you're, you know, you're not even have your real picture there and not your real name and say the most horrible things about people that we're losing our ability to have rational discourse among one another and move forward. So, you know, it's, it's, but that said, there is so much good that comes from everything. I, you know, I laugh all the time. Uh, you know, when I was in college, I had to go to the library and know how to use the Dewey Decimal System to find something. Now, <laughs> now all I've got to do is ask my phone and they'll, it'll give me the answer. So there are so many advancements in our knowledge and information, but I do believe in many ways we've lost a lot of our um, just humanity to one another and uh, just being nice and being, you know, trying our best. My mother taught me very young, when you see somebody, even if they're a stranger, smile, say hello, you know, be nice, try to be a ray of sunshine in someone's day. And, you know, we're kind of losing that because now when you walk through anything, you know, right now you walk through an airport and no one's there, but in a normal time, you know, everybody is staring at their phone with earbuds yes. in and we're losing our ability to connect with one another. So long answer to that, but, um, I, you know, I just think if people worked harder, at trying to put themselves in other people's shoes and understand where they're coming from and not just think, if you disagree with me, you're an evil person, uh, the world would be a lot better. Yes, you know, John, I love this so much. And there's this quote of you, and I'm probably going to butcher it now, but you said something along the lines in your book of, we're not in a financial business, we're in the people business. Oh, absolutely. And I think this really sums it up, right? At the end of the day, you're always talking 
to people, right? You're dealing with people in anything that you do in any kind of field that you might even, you know, go into for our listeners. At the end of the day, it's learning how to deal with people. And I think this, this is so critical. All of the things that you just mentioned here. You know, Max, you were uh, to that. I, when I was working, it's interesting. When I got out of uh, university and then got a job, which was with what became Primerica, it was called A.L. Williams then, and I was working in Atlanta. I started working on my master's in business administration in 1982. And I worked on it until 1988. I did it at night, you know, after work, oh, yeah. hmm. going downtown to Georgia State University in Atlanta to get my MBA. And um, the number at that time, it was when Atlanta was really starting to become a technology hub. There was a company in Atlanta, a large company at that time, Scientific Atlanta, that was in the satellite business and, you know, one of the early kind of data communication businesses and stuff. And there were a lot of engineers in my classes and the number of people that I met and knew then that in all honesty were smarter than me, you know, academically smarter, but that never really got ahead. I mean, they, they were engineers, but they, you know, the reason they were doing this is they wanted to move on up in management and be CEOs and stuff and that that never happened for them. And in truth, for most of, most of them, it was because they were incredibly smart, but they had no people skills. Yeah. They had, you know, I mean, they had absolutely zero ability to connect with people, to communicate with people, and to move people. When you're a leader, you got to realize all of the people you deal with aren't human beings, they're human becomings. They're they're trying to move toward, through their journey in life and get better. And if you develop an ability to inspire them, to uh, have them feel that you're helping them achieve things they want to achieve in life, where they trust you and know that you're telling them the truth and you're trying to do things better, it's amazing what you can accomplish. And um, so I don't care what business you're in, you're in the people business because you're working with people, you're dealing with people, you're marketing to people, and your ability to connect with people, inspire people, and gain their trust is the most critical component of being a great leader in my opinion. You know, I'm, I'm so curious right now. So in, in your book, you talk about, um, or you, I mean, you just talked about the, the, those, those insights from college, right? And in your book, you talk about the story of one of your former professors where, you know, who said basically that, you know, either you end up getting a doctorate in economics or become the CEO of a public company, right? So, and, and you also shared a story of, you know, always being the funniest guy at parties and, and college. So is there, is there a connection there in the sense that, you know, social intelligence that you develop, maybe, maybe it is even at parties in college, right? But that then later helped you succeed in business because you were able to, to deal with people like that? Well, you know, yeah, for me personally, absolutely. I, I think, you know, look, we all have, I always tell people, in fact, I, uh, University of Georgia, usually once a year, I'll lecture at a class in the business school, um, uh, a leadership class. And, um, you know, my, when you look at yourself, and, and I, I talk about this in the book, you have to find your skills. What are you good at without trying? And we all have those things. What are you good at without trying? And then try that. Most people spend out work at that. Most people spend their whole life working on their weaknesses, which by the way, we all ought to work on our weaknesses, but we ought to work more on what we're naturally good at. Look, I could go out, I was never fast, okay? I was a good athlete, but I was never fast. I could have worked for years and never been in the Olympics. I mean, you know, if you're not, if you don't have some natural ability at something, chances are you're not, even if you work at it, the best you'll ever be at it is okay. You'll never be great. So I always had, through my parents, through how I was raised in the southern United States in a small community, everybody, we were all talkative. A family reunion of mine is 
you know, like so loud, you know, it's loud with people talking and everything. Um, I always had that ability. And so I figured out how to harness my ability to communicate, my ability to tell a story, my ability to get people to go, oh, yeah, I get it, okay, to, to help me get ahead. And, and I do believe, regardless of whether maybe you're so introverted, you don't like to talk to people and stuff. So a lot of times that becomes an excuse. I'm just not that way. I'm not talkative, whatever. The truth is you, we need to all work as much as we work on our hard skills, on our soft skills. It is your ability to connect with people. If you're going to be a leader, if you're just going to be a computer programmer and all you're going to do is program and do that, okay, that's one thing. But if you say, okay, I'm wanting to be a leader, I'm wanting to be in management, I'm wanting to move into those positions, you have to develop your soft skills. I always tell people, you know, when people work for me and work with me for years, I mean, I wanted to know about their family. I wanted to know who their kids, how their kids were doing. I would start meetings with people. I wouldn't just walk in and sit down. And Now, in a crisis time, I'd walk in and it was all business. But under normal times, you know, hey, Max, how you doing? How's your family? Everybody safe and healthy? How's it going? Kids back in school? Well, tell me about it. To just connect with a person, it's amazing how much more people will want to do for you if they know you genuinely, you don't just care about them because they come in and do a job. You actually care about them. So, look, all I know, and you know, I always tell people, you know, everybody's different, different styles, different things work for all, you know, work. I mean, there's not, not one leadership style. When I say real leadership, I don't mean one style. I mean being the authentic you. But I, I just know that worked for me. Okay, and um, yeah, I was always the person who, you know, kind of could make myself a center of attention and stuff like that at a party or whatever. And um, I, you know, I figured out how to utilize that skill um, in a way to not just be the funniest guy at the pub but to, you know, be somebody who, because I also believe humor. Look, you know, the ability to laugh at yourself. A lot of us are so sick. We laugh at other people, but good God, not at ourselves. And, you know, the ability to have a little bit of self. I always, you know, I used to always say, you know, don't take yourself so seriously because no one else does. Okay. <laughs> You know, you know, we're all just doing the best we can trying to get through this mortal veil that we live in that honestly now just turned 63 goes by fast. I mean, I can't believe it goes by so fast. Yeah. You know, lighten up. I used to always tell people, lighten up, loosen up, and grow up. Okay? <laughs> I mean, you know, don't take yourself so serious. Lighten up. Loosen up. Don't be such a ball of stress and everything. And then grow up. You know, I, 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 one of the things I tell the young people that are in this graduate business class when I lecture to it is I say, guys, look, you know, you're heading out into the world because this is like their senior, their final year as an MBA program. And I always go, look, I'm going to give you handful of just keys. Number one, I believe the greatest ability is likability. That if people like you, if you know what you're doing, so you got to have all your competences and the things that you're doing, but if you have all of that and you're likable, it'll get you ahead. The second thing is when you go out into the real world and it's not your mother asking this question, somebody says, how are you doing? They don't want to hear every problem. <laughs> okay. So I always train people, tell people, say, my answer when somebody says, how you doing, John? Unbelievable. Because it can be unbelievably crappy 
or it can be unbelievably great. <laughs> unbelievable coverage. Always okay. works. <laughs> Always works. So just, hey, I'm unbelievable, okay? Because you you know them, Max. People that if you say, how are you doing? I mean, my God, by the time they're finished talking to you, you want to jump off a bridge. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so anyway, just that soft skills, working on the ability to use words and connection uh, to get things done, um, I think is is as important as any other skill you develop if you want to be a leader. You know, John, I love this so much. In fact, this was quite literally probably my biggest problem. So when I was in my undergraduate degree, I was pretty much probably the exact opposite of, of you. You know, I was like the one that would never go to a single party, you know, not talk to people. I was super introverted, super shy. And once I graduated, I realized that this is literally the key to, to life, right? To relationships, friendships, enjoying life, all of it, right? And so I really had to develop that over the last couple of years, this ability to just talk to people and have fun, right? And and all of these things, and so I'm loving this so much. And it also ties right in with this leadership practice number one that you talk about in your book, which is deciding who you are and who you wanna be. And what I love about that so much is this aspect of decision. So it's not, you know, finding out somewhere outside of us who we are, but it's really deciding internally, like, what do I want to be? You know, who do I want to be? Who do I want to become? Right. And so can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, what that, what those decision looks like in that process of being a human becoming as you call it. Right. Well, you know, it's Max, I, the word decide ends with aside, like homicide, suicide. Okay. And aside, if that is on a word usually is, relating to the death of something. Well, when you decide, really decide, that means kind of the death of other options, okay? Most people go through life never committing to anything. They change, they change goals, jobs, everything like they change underwear every day, okay? <laughs> And you've got to make, life is about decisions. Life, I mean, you know, it's, if it was, life isn't easy. Guess what? You know, it's hard. It's difficult. There's challenges. Things aren't perfect. I always tell people, you know, look, you know, and I don't, I don't know, you know, if you, you know, you know like carnivals in, in, uh, in Switzerland, but it's a big one here. Yeah. <laughs> we have carnivals that we call fairs in the, in the autumn. And I always tell people, if you're in life looking for fair, they have them in the autumn and you can go there and ride rides and have, you know, food that's bad for you. Okay. The truth is in life, it's not fair. It's not. Uh, some people are luckier. Some people get breaks. You just go, how did this idiot, you know, have that happen for them? <laughs> I'm much smarter. I work much harder. That's well, not fair. So you've got to decide who you want to be, what you want to become, and then go for it. Get after it. We're, you're not getting out of this life alive. Everybody lives like they have unlimited mortality. They don't. And, and, and be happy. You know, I, I always tell people, my biggest definition of success is that you're happy. Yeah. Now, I know bitter billionaires, okay? People with all the money you can imagine who are basket cases, bitter, not happy, you know, just miserable people. And then I know people, there's a gentleman over at the University of Georgia who's in the communications area and he's written several books. He's involved with the University of Georgia athletic program that I'm very involved with. And he's never made a lot of money, but he's met 
tons of people. He's great friends with Jack Nicholas, the golfer. Every time I call him, he's fly fishing somewhere with some great person to be with. He's the person I've learned to call and say, hey, do you know somebody with whatever and stuff? And I told him one day, and, 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 and he doesn't have a lot of money, never made a lot of money. But I told him one day, I said, Lord, you're the most successful person I know. Wow. He went and he went, John, come on. I mean, you guys, y'all get have money. And I said, you know, yeah, you're happy. I've never known anybody that knows more people. Every time I call you, you're, you know, I'm playing golf with Jack Nicholas in Scotland or I'm doing this or whatever. I said, you know, when when you're when you come when we're all hurtling each day toward an event we had just not as soon not go to our funeral. Okay. And when that day happens, they're not going to drive a Brinks truck with your money in it <laughs> and dump it into the ground with you. They're not going to, and, and, and I guarantee you at the end of our lives, one of the things we're going to most focus on is were we happy? So decide who you are, go for it and be happy. And a lot of people wait on circumstances to make them happy. Oh, when I pay off these bills, when my kids get to a certain age, when this happens, when that happens, I'll be happy. If you're waiting on circumstances to make you happy, you'll never be happy. Okay. You, you've got to decide that you're going to just, you know, look at life as an adventure be happy and go for it. So, you know, that's kind of what I, that's very much what I mean about that. Max. You know, this is so important, especially this whole aspect of redefining success as truly living a happy life, a life with connections, right? A life where you have friendships and relationships that truly mean something. I think this is so key. And, you know, on the show, we've had, you know, monks, we've had leading psychologists that all talk about the same thing, but I've, haven't really heard, you know, leading CEOs, especially of public trade, publicly traded companies talk about that. So where did that come from for you? Like, was there a certain point in time in your career, in your life where you, you know, maybe you start chasing that success and then you realized what true happiness is or where did that, this, this idea come from for you? It was it, it, honestly my parents and particularly my mother. Um, I was an only child raised in a, in a small community. I don't know if you've ever seen, uh, you know, the old U.S. television show from the 60s, the Andy Griffith show. Never seen it, unfortunately. And, 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 and which Mayberry, you know, the little small southern town, that's where I grew up, okay? I mean, I was kind of Opie Taylor, okay? I mean, I grew up in this little small community at a general store and all of these people that were farmers and all these things, but in the church we went to and everything, and nobody had a lot of money. There was not rich people there, but they were happy. I mean, we would go up to the you know general store in the evening, hang out, people telling stories, laughing, all of those things. My parents, I was an only child. Our house, our old house was a, uh, you know, was, you know, kind of a center of the community. People coming in, seeing my parents, wow. laughing, telling jokes and stuff like that. And as I think back, those are some of the happiest days of my life. And it wasn't, now we weren't poor. But we weren't like planning our next, you know, uh, trip skiing in Switzerland or when were we going to get on the yacht and go to Monte Carlo or whatever. I mean, we didn't live that life. And so then as I got out and got in the real world, I, you know, I'm not one of these people that when I started my career was like, oh, my God, I want to be CEO of a company. I want to do this. I want to do that. Uh, you know, I just got in the water and swam and worked hard and worked on myself and got better, developed my skills, and, and it I made it happen, you know, as a part of it. And I've learned about money. My view of money is, hey, look, life's been great. Took a company public. You know, it's not like the Addison family is sitting around going, oh, my God, what are we going to do to pay for things next? Yeah. Hey, life's been good. Okay, 
But I have learned about money. Money makes good people better and bad people worse. Okay. Money is a multiplier. So if you're a great, per if you're a fundamentally happy, good person, let me tell you, it's better to know I ain't got to worry about money. I love in the, you know, in the movie Forrest Gump when uh, he gets the letter from Lieutenant Dan that invested in Apple, uh, you know, or it says, you know, Lieutenant Dan's letter said, we invested in a fruit company and we don't have to worry about money anymore. And he went, well, that's good. That's one less thing to worry about. Okay, that's my view. Okay, and then it gives you the ability to do things when people, some charitable thing that's a good thing in your community needs, you can actually write a check and do things. But money in and of itself is not going to make you happy. I've just seen it too many times. You got to make yourself happy. And then if you want to go after money, go after it. There is nothing wrong with succeeding and getting money and doing it. If, if you're the kind of person that use, utilizes your good fortune, okay? I mean, I'm not a believer the government is the greatest thing on earth at utilizing your good fortune to do good things. <laughs> but, but that you are the kind of person that will utilize your good fortune to do good. Okay. And so anyway, but it, it was, it was a very early in my life thing, Max of, um, of, of, you know, of my parents and how I was raised and the community that I grew up in that I learned, you know, Hey, you don't have to be a Rockefeller uh, to be happy. Okay. Yeah. And, um, so I just think that's important in the world we're in now. I, I look around, I meet people, I see people, I try my best to not watch television and the news and stuff like that now. But then, you know, when I'm reading stuff online, my God, we've got the most miserable, angry people that I've ever seen. <laughs> okay. And, you know, good Lord. I mean, you know, Get happy. Be happy. You're alive. Okay, you've got another day on this earth. You'll never have another day this day again. Okay, and so anyway, I don't know. I just think the most important thing in life is to find a way, to find a place, and to find something that makes you happy. You know, I find this aspect of prioritizing happiness, of putting it first, right, and starting from that base so critical. And I mean, there's so much great research also, right, on this that shows that when we're in a happy state of mind, we're just more productive, right? We're just nicer to people. And I think this is like, this is why it's so much easier to succeed, right? Because we're just engaging with the world and with other people so much more effortlessly when we're in a happy state of mind, right? Because we're not focused on criticizing. We're not focused on putting people down. We're really just focused on uplifting people, right? And, you know, as you call it, shining the light on other people without, you know, having to increase our own ego and all of that. I think that is so key what you're saying here. You know, and it's, and one of the things Max to that is, you know, in my book, I talk about develop a peaceful core. That's one of the uh, principles. And, uh, you know, Norman Vincent Peale and Think and Grow Rich, not, not good Lord, in uh, The Power of Positive Thinking, um, uh, Norman Vincent Peale, Power of Positive Thinking back in the 50s, one of his principles was uh, a peaceful, a peaceful mind, a peaceful core generates power yeah okay and if you i mean you know i'm sorry it's hard to focus and move an organization if you're a human basket case yes okay and if you have a peaceful core if you have a inner tranquility you are a lot better of a, you know, uh, of a kind of a gyroscope for moving the organization in the right direction. So um, I just think all of those things are very important. And 
running around, being angry, being balled up, being stressed out, being just a mess. Um, isn't a very good way to go through life. It certainly isn't very rewarding. So, um, you know, I just wish everybody would quit yelling at each other so much. Listen a little bit more, okay? Try to understand where other people that disagree with them are coming from. Um, and try to work together to, like, make things better. Um, to just, you know, be nice. I mean, that was my mother's, you know, biggest admonition to me anytime I was going anywhere was to be nice. Yes. And um, so all I know is it certainly worked for me in my life. Not saying, I mean, good Lord, I, you know, do so many stupid things and, mm. you know, and all those things because I'm like all of us. I'm a, you know, I'm just a human basket case like we all are. But, um, but do just step back and try to just – be, you know, I always, I always uh, told people, and I think I say this in the book, that, you know, great leaders in my mind, you know, here, I, I, they don't sell it too much on television anymore, but one of the things for when your stomach was upset and acidy was Alka-Seltzer. So you drop, you know, the Alka-Seltzer in water and it, it fizzled and you drank it and it calmed your stomach. I always tell people that, you know, leader, great leaders are human alka -Seltzers. They calm things down, okay? Yeah. Some leaders think the more they agitate everybody, you know, the better, you know, the better leader they are. My view was always, hey, let's calm down. I, you know, I used to always, when people would come in and go, John, we have a crisis. I, you know, I'd go, okay, as a result of what happened, how many people are dead? Well, no, we don't have a crisis. I mean, crises involve dead people. Okay, <laughs> yeah. the, you know, COVID nineteen is a global crisis. People are dying. Okay, having the, your your accounting system mess up at month end is not a crisis. It's a situation. Yeah. Okay, it's a challenge, and so. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I never, you know, I never led troops into battle, okay? You're dealing with a crisis there when men around you are dying, okay? I never was a trauma surgeon, people dying if you make a mistake. That's, you know, hey, I never had to do that, okay? That was, I ran a company. And so the ability to step back, you know, I always hate athletes. That, you know, I love American football, University of Georgia, college football. But, I, you know, when guys that are playing that going, you know, we're warriors. We're going, yeah. oh, you're playing a game. <laughs> okay? You're playing a game. Warriors get shot at and killed. Okay? So the ability to step back, chill out, calm down, Calm others around you. You make much better decisions when you ha when you're calm than when you're all stressed out and crazy. Yeah, you know this this ability to put things into perspective and and take that step back. I think is so critical. And you've got this great quote that I love. You said in your book, you've got to win in your mind before you win in life. So. Yeah. How do you create that? Like, you, I know you talk about affirmations under a shower, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but like, what do you do then to to develop this calm core and and this this presence of mind then to be able to deal with situations like that? A lot of it is what you read, okay. What you watch or look at it. You know, I've uh, during this um, you know time of this pandemic, which you know, I think back in February. I was with two of my friends, two of my buddies at the Super Bowl in Miami. And that was like February 8th. And I just think that seems like a century ago now. Yeah. We weren't even, I mean, I'd heard about, but no, we weren't even thinking about what was going on. And, you know, even though I'm quote unquote retired, I travel, you know, I was on the, you know, board of Legal Shield, the U.S. Board of Primerica, 
several consulting arrangements with companies on leadership, uh, you know, utility warehouse in the United Kingdom. I was in London four times a year. And so I was, I, I have, I'm a four million miler on Delta. So I am, you know, I've, I've lived in an airport my adult life, and I, and I like it. I miss it. And so all of a sudden, your life is turned upside down. The last time I was on a plane was in March, right before, you know, right when the world shut down. And so I'm in my office a lot. I've been doing Zoom, 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 Zoom. I mean, I have Zoom, you know, I'm pretty Zoomed up to you know, <laughs> eyeballs and, you know, staying busy. But then, you know, so I've had a lot more time because I'm not running around, going to places, doing the thing I do. And so one of the things I've done is I signed up for this thing, great courses. I've, you know, uh, online, I've watched, you know, done a course in British literature. I'm about to do a course to uh, uh, hone up on my French because I'm dying to go back to Paris someday. Oh, yeah. Just, it's what you allow into your brain. Quit staring at your phone at the next negative news thing that's coming at you. Find hobbies that give you peace. I have a 60 acre, you know, kind of gentleman's farm up um, in North Georgia, and I grow blueberries and raspberries, and oh, I have yeah. bee beehives, and I have a huge garden. And I'm always doing something there. My wife says I'm absolutely crazy because, you know, I've got a little <laughs> crew that works for me and with me. And we're, you know, putting up a, 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 a barn so that I can cook. I love to barbecue and stuff uh, like that there and everything. So, you know, it's find, find things that make you peaceful, not that make you stressful. Okay, I mean, like I said, I watch people, you know, looking at their phone and going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, hey, you know, got it. I, and by the way, I'm not saying ignore what's going on in the world and be a Pollyanna and live in a bubble and all that. I'm not saying any of that. But have a balance in your life and, and, and learn to find, you know, peace and um uh, you know, it may, I, my opinion, it makes all the difference. Okay. It makes all the difference and get up every day and try to find a reason to be happy. Okay. Not get up every day and focus on the latest problem or whatever, you know, just try to be a, try to be a happy person, try to be a positive person. You know, there's a, um, you know, an old, a Native American proverb that talked about, uh, you know, a um, uh, uh, that each of us. It was a an old chief telling his son that you know each of us have two wolves inside of us, one that's happy and and lives a great and satisfied life and does good. And another wolf that's angry and bitter and, and, you know, does destructive things. And his son said, well, which of those wolves win? And he said, the, the chief said, the one you feed. Okay. And, um, you know, in the, uh, in the movie, A Beautiful Mind, um, uh, you know, the professor character that won the Nobel Prize but had schizophrenia and stuff. Um, you know, they were, one of his friends in there was asking him, Russell Crowe plays the professor, if, uh, you know, he still had his delusions and stuff. And he basically says, yes, they're still there. I just choose not to feed them. I feed wow. my dreams and starve my nightmares. Okay. And that's the way we have to be in life. We need to feed, you know, just like you focus on what you feed your body, you need to focus on what you feed your brain. And does it make you happy and peaceful or does it make you stressful and angry? Pretty simple decision. Yeah, so, you know, John, listening to you, it really seems like there's this 
intention that you bring to every single aspect of your life, whether it's to, you know, developing your own personality and deciding who you want to become, whether it's about how you want to show up, whether it's about feeding your mind, there's this intention around like just living the best version of you, right? And I love that so much. Now, before I ask my final question, where can listeners connect with you online? Well, you know, I, I, um, when we were able to show it earlier and stuff before the good, uh, but johnaddisonleadership.com. So all one word, John at J-O-H-N-A-D-D-I-S-O-N leadership.com. That connects you to my different, I'm very active uh, with that on Facebook and, you know, all of the different social media platforms, but that's the best way to connect. And then my book, Real Leadership, uh, is still out there on Amazon. Uh, we're doing a update of the book right now. Hopefully it'll be ready soon with a additional chapter and it's going to be, um, it, it'll be out on Amazon. And then I'm thinking about working on a new book. This is a, I'm thinking about, um, I'm actually outlining a book I've wanted to do for years that um, I, uh, I, I always have had a saying to turn your fears into fuel. Because we all have fears, doubts. We all have them. We all have those things that wake us up at three o'clock in the morning. And, you know, we're, I mean, like I said, we all have those. A lot of people allow their fears and doubts to become the things that keep them from ever doing anything. I've always said you have to turn your fears into fuel. I have always personally been more motivated by the fear of failure than I have the desire of success. I, when I was little, like I was talking about my mother, if she said that she called me Johnny when I was a little, mm -hmm. Johnny, I'm disappointed in you, that was the worst thing I could hear. Okay. And so anyway, but johnaddisonleadership.com and they can connect. I would love for people to connect. And, and again, I, I always tell people my website isn't, I'm trying to sell you something different every 10 minutes or whatever. And I'm not going to warp you to death with emails saying, Hey, I just had a new idea, send $500 and you know, I'll tell you about it. Uh, it really is more of a, you know, forum, to focus on and talk about compassionate, um, focused leadership. You know, I, I love this, John. Um, I can't wait for the next book, by the way. That was another huge topic that unfortunately we did not have time to, to really dissect and discuss today. Um, but, and I, I don't think I've actually ever done this on the show, but I just want to really underscore this book, uh, Real Leadership, fantastic for any leader out there. You just have to absolutely get it. I literally checked on Amazon. It has 4.9 stars which is just ridiculously good out of like over a hundred reviews. So just an absolutely phenomenal book that I think any leader should get. Now, John, final question for you today. What does it mean for you to max out your life? You know, my view of maxing out your life is to think about how you want to be remembered. I, I you know, as I get older now, now, uh, uh, Love Ann and I, I have my wife and I have, he and his uh, wife, Emily, are expecting our first grandchild in wow. January. And um, I always think about how do you want, what do you want your legacy to be? I've always thought, you know, they, the company before we retired, they did a portrait, uh, you know, of me. Uh, that they gave me or whatever and stuff. And so it hangs in our house out in the, uh, in the country. And I want my great grandchildren when I'm, you know, <laughs> no longer around here to be able to look and say, that's the guy that changed our family legacy and our family tree and left a lot of positive impact on the future of our family. Okay, so I believe we should all go through life being as happy as we can every day, enjoying each day and doing everything we can to the fullest and going for it, living a life of adventure. I always tell people, live the stories you want to tell, 
A lot of people live their life. I hate reading about celebrities. I can't stand celebrities. I've met a bunch of them. Most of them are jerks. Okay. I, you know, I am not, I, you know, but a lot of people live their lives vicariously through those people. Live the stories you want to tell. Be the hero to your kids. Be the person your kids look up to. Go for it. Live a great life, but then also focus on, uh, you know, on the future. Uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, talked about, you know, as he, he was in his 80s and was planting, you know, was planting at Monticello, his home, and putting in gardens and things like that, and talked about that he was an old man but a young gardener. I, I don't even know who said this quote. I've attributed it to Jefferson, but it wasn't. But said, to plant trees under whose shade you'll never sit. Yeah. And I'm doing that at my farm right now. I'm planting, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm planting a beautiful maple orchard and stuff like that this autumn. That'll be a beautiful grove that in the fall, the trees will be pretty. You know, they'll get up to a decent size before I'm gone. But the truth is when those things will really be beautiful will be when my grandchildren and great-grandchildren are there. Yeah. And that's the way you should look at your life. Uh, is to is to is to live your life in a way that you make the most of today and make the most of every day that you live, that you go for it, that you have fun, that you impact others in a positive way, you do all of those things, and then you build a life where what you did with your scarce years we all have on this planet impacts others that follow you uh, in the future. And uh, I think if you do that, when you reach the end of the line, you'll look back and go, you know, heck, I didn't just mark time and go through years. I did something. And I think that's the most important. And, and, and my biggest advice in, in wrapping up, and I'd love to some other time, you know, maybe we'll do this again. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> is uh, to just be nice. Everybody, yeah. if everybody would just be nice to one another, um, we'd have a heck of a lot better world. So anyway, Max, it was great, great spending this time with you today and look forward to doing it again in the future. Hey, thank you so much, John. All right, guys, that's it for today. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you gained some valuable ideas, tips, tools, tricks, mindsets, belief systems that will hopefully inspire you to take your life to the next level. At the end of the day, guys, it's all about application. The only thing that's gonna set you apart tomorrow from where you are today is how much action you take with those ideas that you gained. And so I really wanna challenge you at this point to you know, not just listen to this passively, to not just consume this you know, passively, just thinking about other things, but to really take those lessons, take those ideas that you just gained and start applying them to your life. So to really start taking action and sprinting towards those goals and those dreams that you have in your life. Now guys, at this point, I want to ask you for a huge favor. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider heading over to iTunes and leaving a review as that helps me really grow the show and reach more people, impact even more people around the world. You know, if you have a family member, a friend, a loved one maybe that you think could benefit from this content, please consider you know, sharing it with them, forwarding to them as that helps us really build a community of like-minded people that are all about maxing out their lives. Now, guys, with that being said, thanks so much for tuning in today. I really, really appreciate it. Stay strong and see you tomorrow.